Closed captioning for Lift Up Jesus is paid for by our friends at Galpin Ford of Los Angeles. Hey, it's Pastor Dudley again. This is our fourth and final message in our series called The Four Pillars. We're looking at four foundational truths to why we exist. Why does this ministry exist? Pillar number one, if you remember, was to lift up Jesus. That's the very name of this program. Pillar number two, we exist, we stand on the truth of the Word of God. We don't follow culture or popular opinion. We stake our belief and claims on the inspired Word of God. Last week was pillar number three. We looked at the Holy Spirit of God at the moment of conversion, that God puts His presence inside of you. If you are a believer, you have the Spirit of God. Today is pillar number four, the final message. And it has a little different, different twist because it's a, I'll give you a little clue, it's a two, it has two things. It's a two-sided coin. You all know what a coin is. It's a two-sided coin. You say, well, what does that mean? You're going to have to stay tuned, get your Bible out, follow along, and enjoy today's message, the fourth pillar in our series. Today is pillar number four, and it's called, it's going to surprise you, the name of this is called, pillar number four is a two-sided coin. A two-sided coin. I actually have a coin. It's a large coin. It's hard like a coin. You can hear that. It's a little larger than a normal coin, but it is a coin. Amen? It's got two sides. And pillar number four is a two-sided coin. And what I'm going to give you are both sides of the coin right up front. I'm going to tell you point one and point two right here to get go. So you know when I say pillar number four, I'm talking about two things, not one. I want you to write this down, pillar one, or the two sides. One is evangelism, and the other is discipleship. This church exists to evangelize the lost and to disciple the saved. All right? There's a lot of lost people. We've got to somehow figure out how to introduce them to Jesus. That's evangelism. Then... Once they get saved, there's, there's a lot of stuff they need to keep learning and keep growing. So you can write this down. Evangelism is like the birthing of a child. And discipleship is like the raising of a child. Those are two completely different things. Evangelism is birthing the child. Discipleship is raising a child. Now, oftentimes I hear some of the silliest comments spoken by well-intentioned people, but they are simply misinformed. And what they do is they spend their time arguing about which is more important. Is evangelism more important than discipleship, or is discipleship more important than evangelism? Some will argue that we need more evangelism in the church. We need more new converts. The church should be focused on reaching the lost. Others would argue that we need more discipleship. We already have enough people. I mean, look around. It's not the fact that, that uh, we don't have people. We've got people. We've got evangelism. What we need is to disciple people properly. And I say to both camps, you're both right and you're both wrong. You're both right in the fact that we do need more evangelism. There are two million people that live in this valley. Uh, a very few percentage of them are saved. Most of them are lost. Should we ever get to a point where we think, well, there is enough of a save, we don't need to reach anybody else? No. We should have evangelism, amen. amen. And then every single person that gets saved, every single person in the church, they need to be discipled. And so you're both right, we need evangelism, we need discipleship, but you're both wrong if you think that it's either or. It's both. Let me make this crystal clear. This church wants every single lost person in this city to find Jesus Christ. Yes. And we want equally every person that is saved 
we want them to grow up in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not make the mistake of thinking that it's either or. They go hand in hand like Abbott and Costello. Like stink on a skunk. After the resurrection. Everybody say after. After the resurrection, Matthew 28. Jesus has already died. He was buried. He resurrected. And then he met his disciples. If you go to verse 16, the 11 disciples, there were only 11 at this time because Judas had hung himself. They will eventually replace Judas. But at this moment, there's 11, and they went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Picture this scene. After the resurrection, Jesus is up on this mountain with the 11. It was like a retreat. You talk about a mountaintop experience. And I will say this to you, anytime you're with Jesus, it's a mountaintop experience. And so they're with Jesus up on top of this mountain. He says in verse 17, the Bible says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some people doubted. And what that means is they just couldn't believe that he had come back from the dead. They're just having a hard time believing. And then in verse 18, Jesus came to them and said, all authority, not some authority, but all authority in heaven, we kind of knew that part, but all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And what that means is that he's above all kings and kingdoms. He's above all rulers and armies. He's above all presidents and powers. It also means that he's above you and he's above me. It means that he is large and in charge. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, verse 19, therefore. In other words, you better pay attention because he's Lord of all, amen? amen? Here's what I want you to do. He says in verse 19, go. And that word means as you go. Make disciples of all nations. And baptize them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I've told you this, I'll tell you again. If you've never been baptized, you need to be baptized. But you do not get baptized because I want you to be baptized. You don't get baptized because you want to get baptized. You get baptized because Jesus wants you to be baptized. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, write this down. All verse 19 is saying, you need to evangelize the world. Don't forget he's got the disciples on top of this mountain. He's getting ready to leave. He says, guys, pay attention. Uh, I've just died, I've been buried, I've resurrected. Here's what I want you to do, go and evangelize the entire world. Now there's three reasons why we evangelize. Reason number one, we value evangelism because God values evangelism you see god was the one who sent his one and only son to die on that cross for our sins and why would he why would god send his one and only son well so that you and i might be saved did jesus die just for us or did jesus die for the whole world he died for the whole world and so it must evangelism must be pretty important to god if he was willing to sacrifice his one and only son, uh, Jesus himself said in, in uh, Luke 19, verse 10, Jesus said, I've come to seek and save the lost. Jesus said, the reason I'm here, the reason God sent me was to seek and to save that which was lost. And if evangelism, if evangelism, and it is important to God, it should be important to us. The second reason why we value evangelism is because we ourselves have been evangelized because once it happens to you you want everyone to experience what you've experienced amen now here's a hypothetical situation it's kind of silly but let's suppose you wake up uh, tomorrow morning and your foot begins to swell and it hurts and you can hardly walk and all of a sudden your mouth begins to droop and fall and you go see a doctor the doctor looks at you and he goes oh my and you go what and he says, I know what you have. We haven't seen this in 100 years in this country. Well, what is it? He goes, you have Texas hoof and mouth disease. 
He goes, what? He goes, yeah, it hadn't happened in 100 years. You've got Texas hoof and mouth disease. And the doctor says to you, you're not going to believe this, but there is no known cure. You're going to die. And you leave the doctor's office that day, you are depressed. Because you think you're going to die. Because you got Texas hoof and mouth disease. The next day at work, you're kind of walking in, you're all depressed, you're discouraged. And your best friend says, man, what's wrong with you? And then he says, you're not going to believe it. I went to see the doctor about my problem. He says, I got Texas hoof and mouth disease. He says, there's no no, known cure. He says, I'm going to die. And your friend says this to you. He goes, you know what? I remember my great grandmother talking about Texas hoof and mouth disease. She's almost 100 herself. And I think she had a recipe that would cure that. And you would say, well, where does your grandma? Is she still still where she lived? And he would tell you, well, let's go find great-great, your great-grandma. So you would go find great-grandma. And as soon as you walk in that house, great-grandma looks at you and goes, I know what's wrong with you. you got Texas hoof and mouth disease. I haven't seen that in 100 years. (laughs) You would say, well, your your great-grandson says that you have a cure. She goes, you know, I do believe, I, I, I do, and if I can find that recipe, she goes and she looks and she finds this recipe. She takes these roots from this particular tree and some herbs and she mixes this concoction all together and, and she goes, if you'll drink this, you, it'll cure you. And uh, he drinks it, it's the worst tasting stuff, but he drinks it and as soon as he drinks it, his foot begins to go down, it doesn't hurt, his mouth goes back up, he's hell, he's cured, he's cured, great grandmama gave him the s- solution, Right? And uh, what would you do? Well, you would leave there hopping and skipping and whistling and cheering. Why? Because you've been cured of Texas hoof and mouth disease. (laughs) Now, what happens if the following week you're walking down and a friend of yours coming and his foot's all swollen and he's doing this and he's walking towards you? What would you do? You'd say, man, what's wrong with you? And he says to you, he goes, you're not going to believe this. I, I went to the doctor. I've got this thing that's never been seen in 100 years. It's called Texas hoof and mouth disease. And the worst part is the doctor says I'm going to die. What, what are you going to say at that moment? Are you going to say, man, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. <laughs> I, I do want you to know, brother, I'll be praying for you because I know, I know this is a tough time for you. you. Is there anything you want me to say at your funeral? I mean, because I'll, I'll be there. I'm going to be there on the front row. Are you going to say that or are you going to say, you got what? I got Texas. Oh, I know a lady. She's a great. She's over. She's still alive. She's got this recipe. Come with me. I had the same thing that happened to me. She cured me. She could cure you. Are you going to act like that or are you just going to say, brother, I'll be praying for you? <laughs> you see, in the, in the exact same way, every single person, if you're saved, you were once lost and now you've been found. You were once blind, but now you can see. And all around us, all over the city are people who are lost and they're gonna die and there is no cure for their sin except one thing, Jesus Christ. And you've experienced Jesus Christ. Don't you see we value evangelism because we ourselves have experienced evangelism if you've ever experienced grace if you've ever experienced forgiveness if you've ever experienced salvation you can't help yourself you want the whole world to experience what you've experienced but there's a third reason why we value evangelism and that is because we value people if you have any love for people if you have any love of any kind for anybody you'll want them to be saved because You don't want them to go to hell. Someone said this once, and I don't even know who said it. They said, best friends don't let best friends go to hell. That's why we value evangelism, because we love people. We value people. Then we come to verse 20. Verse 19 is evangelism. But look what verse 20 says, and. Everybody say the word and. So go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, verse 20 after you baptize them teach them to obey everything i have ever commanded you and surely i will be with you always to the very end of the age and what he's saying is this 
when someone is baptized, that is not the end. That is only the beginning. After someone is baptized, they need to be taught, they need to be mentored, they need to be discipled. They've gotta learn to obey everything that Jesus ever taught. That's discipleship. Verse 19 is evangelism, verse 20 is discipleship. It's a two-headed coin. Now write this down, discipleship means it's that process of maturing someone in their faith. You should be maturing in your faith. There are several passages in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, Hebrews 5, verse 13, 1 Peter 2, 2, that all talks about if you're not growing in your faith, you're just a baby. You're a baby in Christ. You hear that baby crying right there? That's just a baby. And it's okay to be a baby when you're supposed to be a baby. But when you're, you've been a Christian for four, five, six, seven, eight years and you're still acting like a baby, something's wrong. So verse 19 is evangelism, verse 20 is discipleship. Jesus said to teach them everything that I have ever commanded you. Stay with me, they're up on this mountain. It's a mountaintop experience. Jesus is getting ready to leave. And what he's saying in verse 19 and 20 is, guys, listen, you've got to get down off the mountain and get down amongst the people. And when you get down off this mountain and you rub shoulders with people, go wherever you go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then after they're baptized, you continue to teach them to obey everything that I have ever commanded you. That's discipleship. That's the two sides of a coin. Write this down, number three. All of that, pillar number four, is simply making Christ followers. Evangelism and discipleship is all about the process of seeing people become followers of Jesus Christ. And you have to hear me out on this. Every single person in this room has been given that task. It's not just the preacher's job to do that. Okay? It's all of our jobs. God has placed you in the schools that you attend. He's placed you in the neighborhoods that you live. He's placed you in the corporations where uh, you work. He's placed you in the school, on on the club, the team that you're on. He's got you there so that you can help lead people to Christ and then disciple them in Christ. When you go by and you see those 12 pillars of fire, as you go from the uh, west to the east, you will see the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And when you you go from the east to the west, you will see the names of the 12 disciples that were up on that mountaintop with Jesus. Jesus. And whenever you see those pillars, there ought to be something that just goes, Lord, thank you, because those 12 tribes of Israel, that's where Jesus came from. You need to be thankful that those 12 tribes brought us Jesus. But when you see those 12 disciples, those are the guys that were up on that mountain with Jesus in Matthew 28 after the resurrection and said to them, go, get off this mountain, go down in the valley, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey everything that I have ever taught you. And then Jesus left. And those 11 disciples came down off that mountain and they led people to Christ and discipled people who led people to Christ who discipled, who led people to Christ, who discipled, and that process has gone on for 2,000 years. My point being, you wouldn't be saved if those 11 guys had dropped the ball. We're saved because they followed, verse 19 and verse 20, after Jesus left. And so in your heart, there should be a sense of gratitude for what those 12 
disciples did. Now, as we prepare to close, write these last few things down, all right? Here's what I need you to do. First of all, you need to start praying every single day for five people. Amen. Just get you a piece of paper, write five names of people that you start to pray for. Now, what that's going to do is two things. Number one, it's going to give you a conscious awareness of their spiritual condition, but more importantly, the Holy Spirit of God, you're asking God's Spirit to go work in their life. Number two. At some point, you need to tell them that you've been praying for them. Now, don't do it the first day or the second day, but after about five months, three months, four months, you go to this brother, this sister, and you go, hey man, can I tell you something? What? I just want you to know for the last five months, every single morning at seven o'clock, I've gotten down on my knees. I just want you to know, I know you're going to think, I know you're going to think this is strange, but I just want you to know that I've been praying for you every single day. Well, why are you doing that? I, I just love you and care about you and want you to know the Savior that saved me. And that person is going to, when you tell someone you've been praying for them every day, for, what do you think that does to them inside? They go, they're going to go, you must really care about me. I do. I've been praying for you for five months, and you know what? I'm, I'm going to keep praying for you. I'm going to keep praying for you. Now, we have 10,000 people in this church. If every one of us prayed for five people, that means that every day this church could be praying for 50,000 people by name by name can you imagine that don't you see God begin to work in their lives and in the life of this church number three now this is important you need to model Jesus in everything you do I got a guy in the church he's a friend of mine he owns a tattoo a tattoo store and I go in to see him just to stop in and say hello. So if you see me walking in and out of a tattoo store, I'm not getting a tattoo. <laughs> I'm going in there to see my buddy. And this week I went into his shop and he was asleep on the couch. Had the hat pulled down and he was snoring. There's stuff going all through the store. And he's, I went in and I went in and I took a picture of him and me. He doesn't even know. I took a picture of him and me, a little selfie, because my arms are really long. I took a selfie. <laughs> and then I, I sent him this note. I sent him the picture. I said, hey. He's sleeping. I said, it looks like you were listening to one of my sermons. <laughs> and he said this to me. He goes, no, I was listening to one of Rick Warren's sermons. I said, well, that makes a lot of sense. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I walked into his store. They had this rap music going on through the store. And I heard all the, like every other word was the F word or the N word. And this guy, he owns a store. Goes to this church. It's a friend of mine. I said, man, I, I walked in that store. I didn't hear Rick Warren. I didn't hear, all I heard was the F word and the N word. Oh, no, 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 that wasn't, that wasn't, no, no, pastor. I said, no, 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 here's the photograph. <laughs> I'm in your store. And he goes, well, someone must have changed the channel. Well, you're the owner of the store, right? What is my point by that? The reason we can't lead people to Christ is because they don't, there's no difference between us and the rest of the world. And you and I, I don't care if you're even in a tattoo store. You and I need to model Jesus Christ Every day and whatever we're doing, we need to act and live and reflect Jesus. And number four, invite, 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 invite. Just keep on inviting. Invite people to your life group. Invite people to the youth department. Anytime I see a, ba a couple with a little baby, I go, oh, that's a cute little baby. I always say this, have you dedicated that baby? No. Well, really, we have a baby dedication at our church. Re yeah, I'll give you the number. I saw a guy this week. He's been sober for 10 years. He goes to AA meetings. I said, hey, do you know, did you know that at our church we have an AA meeting on Monday nights? It's called CPR. He goes, what does that stand for? 
I go, Christ Powered Recovery, CPR. Never heard of it. You just invite people. Just, just say, keep coming to church. There's a guy yesterday I invited to come to church. I'm not exaggerating. I've invited him a hundred times. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to invite him another hundred times until eventually he comes. Amen? Now, this coin, what's the two sides of the coin? Evangelism and? Now, if, you're in, if you don't have any evangelism or discipleship going on in your life, watch. Watch this coin. See this coin right here? It's a big coin right there. You take that. If you don't have, look, look, look. Did you see that? Did, did you see that? Don't worry, I still got the coin. If there's money involved, I know where it is. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know where the money is. All right, so I'll do this again. If you have the coin right there, you just take it right there. Look, 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 look. It's gone. But if you don't have evangelism or discipleship, you got nothing. There's a third side to a coin. I don't know if your coins actually have three sides. There's this side, this side, but there's what's called the edge. You know what, you know what the edge represents to me? effort evangelism discipleship and effort all it takes is a little effort every single person you meet every person you see try your best pray seek god ask for the right words model jesus christ and just don't give up effort work you got to get off the mountaintop this is the mountaintop experience you got to get off the mountain roll up your sleeves and get to work and try to lead people to christ each and every day and then help them to grow and mature in faith. That's worth a lot right there. Oh, I want to thank you for tuning in today. I, I just love preaching the Word of God and to think about these four foundational pillars. One, to lift up Jesus, which is the name of our program. Two, we exist to stand and preach and teach the Word of God in an uncompromising manner. Three, we believe that anything that happens is the Spirit of God working in your heart and in my heart. And then today's message, the fourth pillar, is the two-sided coin. We exist to do evangelism and to do discipleship. Jesus called us to take the gospel and to go into all the world and preach the good news. There's a lot of stuff going on today about fake news. I care about the good news of Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for watching. Thank you for participating. If you want a copy of this message or any of this series, you can always log on to our website. We just want you to know that we love you. We'd love to have you call us on the number beneath on the screen and just let us know what you're thinking. Let us know if this series, this program means anything to you. If you have a prayer request, give us a call. If you'd like to support, we'd love to have you be a partner, but thank you again for tuning in and we will see you next week. And remember, whatever you're doing, don't forget to always lift up Jesus.